The art of convincing an audience that what they're seeing and hearing on screen is absolutely real is something of a deft trick to pull off. For every Blair Witch or Paranormal Activity, there's a hundred clones that don't quite manage to achieve that almost hypnotic state in the viewer for absolute hysteria to take place. By the time Blair Witch had hit cinemas in the UK in 1999, despite the very clever internet campaign and marketing, word was already out that it was in fact not found footage but pure fiction. The spell was broken, the trick was exposed. The Lumiere brothers created quite a stir with the first cinematic airing of a train arriving at a station, reports of audience members trying to escape the oncoming train on screen has been debated in the century since. But the power the image would have had on the first witnesses of such a spectacle certainly has not. Reports of how a radio broadcast of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds by the influential filmmaker Orson Welles in 1938 Panicked America have since been recognised largely as an entertaining myth. Newspapers at the time, feeling somewhat threatened by the relatively new medium of radio, highly exaggerating the supposed hysteria created by the show, and radio glad to perpetuate the myth, proving the power of their platform. So how would you pull off the ultimate scare? How would you keep the illusion up for sufficient viewers to be convinced that what they are watching is the real deal? How would you get jammed switchboards and families terrified to go to bed that night? The BBC achieved this in 1992. Their show had many of the elements of those previously mentioned, the cam footage styles of Blair Witch and Paranormal Activity the live broadcast approach of the infamous War of the Worlds radio production. But what if you got household names to present it? Faces that the public had trusted for bringing them facts and information for many years. What if you thought nothing was going to happen? And then it did. Ghost Watch aired on Halloween night. And to be absolutely fair to the BBC, there was no deception in the run-up to the broadcast. It was a Scream 1 production well-known anthology drama series that had run for quite some time. Radio Times featured the main actor Michael Parkinson on the front cover that very week. Moments before transmission, they made it very clear this was a screenplay. Screen One presents an unusual and sometimes disturbing film marking Halloween. Michael Parkinson, Sarah Green, Mike Smith and Craig Charles star in Ghost Watch. Written by screenwriter Stephen Volk, who'd previously worked with William Friedkin on The Guardian two years earlier, and horror dramas The Kiss and Ken Russell's Gothic, Volk was becoming quite the heavyweight in the genre. But the illusion here was so seamlessly perfect for 1992. The moment the show began, you told yourself, well, I've misunderstood. This is obviously a live broadcast. <laughs> The studio, high-tech for the time, but schlocky enough to keep the casual Halloween viewer entertained, a bank of TV screens to show when something didn't happen because nothing ever did on these shows. It only had an hour to run, the ghosts weren't exactly going to put in a special appearance just for the BBC. The first clue that this might be worth sticking with is when we're shown previous footage of the girls' bedroom from the house in question. Now, things are looking eerily familiar. The post-war home, the suburban streets, the vulnerable sisters. Some may have made the connection already over the similarities with this and the infamous Enfield case in the 1970s. Told in complimenting style since by the Sky Witness show The Enfield Haunting. And James Wan's Conjuring 2. We meet Sarah and Craig on location, just to remind us there's nothing to fear here. Sarah Green, renowned by children and families for being the vibrant, amiable host of Saturday morning television and stalwart after-school staple Blue Peter. And Craig Charles, as much known at the time for the cheeky charm he could bring to live TV as his acting credits. Viewers are invited to call in with Sarah's real-life husband and radio presenter Mike Smith manning the phone lines. 
Finally, completing the studio lineup, there's parapsychologist Dr. Lynn Pascoe, played by little known at the time actress Gillian Bevan. A better known face, of course, would dismantle the reality being created by Volk. We're introduced to the notion of pipes, a pet name given to the presence by the sisters as early manifestations included loud banging in the central heating. We're shown broken crockery, allegedly from poltergeist activity at the residence. Sarah settles in with the family, apple bobbing and relaxing with the children, seemingly unfazed by the notion of spending an evening in a supposedly haunted house. While outside, Craig takes to the streets interviewing local residents. Emma from Slough calls in, convinced she'd seen a figure in the footage of the girl's bedroom earlier. There's a fake scare from Craig in his usual entertaining style, and there's even the bad links and camera mishaps you'd expect from a live presentation. The sisters share their experiences with pipes, the younger girl Kimmy being more forthcoming than Suzanne, shows Sarah a picture she'd drawn of it. Mum Pamela is less so. Pamela is more camera conscious and seems genuinely shaken by the occurrences, recounting a frightening incident of being trapped in the glory hole under the stairs with an ominous presence. Back in the studio, the backstage team have the bedroom footage ready to play again in order to debunk the appearance of the mysterious figure spotted by some callers. Suzanne turns out the light, and there in the corner is something. The viewer can see this. Michael and Dr. Pasco aren't so sure. It's a camera glitch. It's a fold in the drapes. They rewind the clip just to double check. Now it is just a street light hitting the curtains. False alarm, says Michael. Then the real scares begin. The audience are privy to a recording made by Dr. Pasco of the older sister, Suzanne. Apparently under the influence of some sinister, rasping entity, the studio falls silent as the reels turn. The lights are dimmed. Dr. Pasco can be heard trying to make sense of the guttural grunts coming from the youngster. It's quiet now. Who are you? Michael listens intently. You may be forgiven as you watch the tape turning and the doctor standing by for missing the dim but definite shape standing behind her. The panic starts. The phone number on screen being fictitious for the screenplay, concerned viewers couldn't get through. Assuming it was jammed or faulty, they began to call the BBC directly instead. But the show, of course, continues. We're shown pictures of Suzanne from some months ago, her face covered in fresh cat-like scratches. A skeptic is consulted live from the US, who only serves to ruffle Dr. Pasco's feathers. There's nothing to report from the house, so Sarah recounts an incident of her own. You have to fill the hour somehow. Kimmy is tired and wants to go to bed. Suzanne is watching TV downstairs. Sarah makes coffee for the camera and sound crew. Things seem too quiet. Back at base, there's an unrelated account from someone who wants to remain anonymous. This incident is darker. Much darker. The narrator recalls finding saliva and other bodily secretions all around his flat. This is unpleasant stuff now. On location, Craig chats to locals about their experiences with the family and unsettling stories of missing children, knivings and mutilated animals in the area. Suddenly, this isn't light-hearted TV. There's a brief chat with Mr. Arthur Lacey, who had attempted unsuccessfully to exercise the family's home, only to suffer sickness and repercussions of his own. But the interview is cut short by Michael, who's had some news from the house. It could be anything, but the team have discovered a perfectly circular wet patch on the lounge carpet. They check for leaks and take a sample. Pasco is convinced this is typical poltergeist activity. Are things starting to happen at Fox Hill Drive? 
After all, match of the day is due to start in just 10 minutes time. Viewers are calling now with incidents occurring to them live as they watch the show, though even Dr. Pasco is skeptical. But back at Fox Hill, things are starting to happen. Knocks and scratchings are moving around the walls. The girls are frightened. Pipes is here. The knocking escalates to loud thudding and banging. Downstairs, Kimmy's sketches are arranged on the dining room floor. Could it be the sisters? Or could it be Pipes? The thudding begins again, but Michael warns Sarah not to go upstairs as both girls aren't accounted for. Kimmy is in the bedroom, but where is Suzanne? A frantic panning of static cameras reveals nothing, but then... That's it then. It's been Suzanne all along, hasn't it? Pasco is shocked, but attempts to defend her work. It means nothing. It's a pattern to fake phenomena if nothing is happening. Michael just wants to hear if Suzanne is okay. Suzanne just wants her mum. It was what you wanted, wasn't it? We just gave you what you wanted. Mum Pam is angry and distraught. My family are telling the truth. We're all telling the truth. Studio, but Ghostwatch has one final act. The phone lines are still receiving calls regarding the bedroom footage, all with the same description of the figure in the corner. And one caller horrified that her glass table shattered before their eyes. Her husband was badly injured. Glass everywhere. <laughs> face and hands were cut. There's blood on the wallpaper. The ambulance has just gone. Her clocks have stopped. She blames the show. Michael does what Michael does and calmly and convincingly reassures her and all viewers that this is just a show. And Dr. Pasco requests a clip from earlier when Kimmy describes pipes exactly as frightened viewers had seen. Perhaps all isn't done. There's a development at Fox Hill. Mum Pam can hear cats. Very faint at first, but there it is. From in the walls. Suzanne scratches our back, fresh and prominent. Sarah seems out of her depth now, somewhat panicked. What do you want us to do? S Sarah, what do we do? Sarah, you're all right. And now Ghostwatch pulls its trump card for Halloween. The show is overrunning, and a final call from a viewer confirms that her childhood urban myth, child killer Mother Seddens, used to live in that very house. Sarah's husband, Mike, is concerned for his wife. But she assures him she's fine. They're taking the kids out of the house. But Kimmy wants to stay and talk to Pipes. Look, everybody wants to see him. Michael begins a professional summary and roundup of the evening. Mike Smith reads the final telephone messages. But Ghostwatch isn't quite done, and Pipes isn't quite finished. Sarah. Sarah, are you, are you all right? So, I can hardly hear you.
notoriety of Ghost Watch is in its wholly undeserved legacy. Up to 30,000 panic viewers jamming BBC switchboards until nobody could get through. Record complaints following the broadcast sealed its fate. With it deemed a deliberate attempt to cultivate a sense of menace and excessively distressing and graphic, reports of two children suffering PTSD following the show and the tragic account of 18-year-old Martin Denham. Martin took his own life just five days after the airing, leaving a note to his parents saying, If there are ghosts, I will be with you always as a ghost. The show was never repeated. This was potent television, perhaps in a way that the BBC never even deemed possible. But in spite of the tainted aftermath, there is much to be proud of here. This is a Milgram-esque experiment in real hysteria. Bill! Ghostwatch is available on DVD and occasionally on streaming platforms, and I highly recommend finding out for yourself how to truly scare a nation. Hope you enjoyed this one guys, if you did please consider liking and subscribing to our channel Scouts of Horror, there's lots more content on the way so see you for the next one.